The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to worship on this Lord's Day, this fourth Sunday of Advent. We are so glad to have you with us, so glad to have you participating as we have journeyed through this Advent season. This Sunday, the fourth Sunday of Advent, is the Sunday that we join congregations uh, around the country, around the world, in donating to the Christmas Joy Offering. We, this is an offering that is received for the care of uh, retired ministers and their families, and also it uh, provides educational opportunities as well. I'm calling this the first day of receiving the Christmas Joy Offering, uh, because since we cannot gather here together and, and bring our, off, our offering envelopes uh, together on the same day, this will be the first day of the next several weeks uh, continuing to the end of the year. So I invite you to participate in that and to give uh, generously. I certainly extend a warm invitation and welcome to our Christmas Eve service. The Christmas Eve service this year will be broadcast in two parts. The first part will be uh, music from a number of wonderful musicians. The second part will be lessons and carols, uh, closing at the end with our traditional singing of Silent Night. Ahead of that, of your listening to that, watching that service, I invite you to gather candles for those in your midst, and when we get to the at that point in the service to light your candles off the Christ candle in your own um, Advent wreath and then join in the singing as we close out Christmas Eve. Speaking of singing, I must say a special, special thank you to all of our children and their families who have participated in so many ways during this Advent season sometimes reading, sometimes playing, sometimes singing. Uh, we have such a wonderful gift of children and young people, and they want to participate. They want to be a part of our worship. And so I thank each and every one of you for enriching us in that way. The beautiful flowers you will see today by the pulpit are given uh, by Don Bean in memory of his wife, Marjorie Pixley Bean, who two days ago, on December 18, would have turned 90 years old. Uh, Marjorie left Don 10 years ago, but of course is held in his heart forever. And Don, we thank you for these beautiful flowers. And now, let us prepare our hearts to worship God. Although some things in 2020 have looked different and it has taught us to be flexible, Christmas is still coming. And we will be doing a recorded Christmas Eve service that will be coming to you on Christmas Eve morning that you can watch at your leisure with your family whenever you would like. But we have some new things to do on Christmas Eve and that's a broadcast live service at 5.30 in our parking lot. Eric and David will be reading scriptures and singing carols, and we will be able to tune our radio stations in to hear them live doing that inside the sanctuary. We will sit safely and warm in our cars, and we will end with a traditional silent night candlelit singing. This service will be abbreviated about a half an hour in length, but we hope you will join us in our parking lot where things will look different. But even though they look different, we know that Jesus still comes, Christmas still comes, and that his light shines through us. So we hope to see you at 5.30 in our parking lot for an abbreviated but meaningful Christmas Eve candlelight service. Good morning. For this fourth Sunday of Advent, the organ music comes from two American composers and arrangers. First of all, Richard Purvis, who was born in San Francisco, attended the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia, and then served for 24 years at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco. Mr. Purvis lived a colorful life. During World War II, he served in the Army, and in fact was a prisoner of war in Germany for six months. 
Following that, he had the distinction of being the band leader for the very first band to march down the Champs-Élysées in Paris after its liberation. His piece today is a setting of green sleeves, and uh, you will sense Mr. Purvis's sense of humor in the fact that the Arabian dance from the Nutcracker makes an appearance as part of the prelude. The postlude today is the Besançon Carol, or People Look East for our English ears. Uh, Besançon is a city in eastern France, and this particular tune is a very old one uh, credited to that particular city. The text we know uh, to this tune, People Look East, was written by Eleanor Fargian, uh, a British devout Catholic woman in the 1920s, and she was also responsible for the Morning Has Broken text. For our special music today, we will have uh, an assortment of young folks from our church, and our thanks to Rachel King for organizing that and getting it online for us all this uh, season of Advent. I wish you and your family a very blessed and happy Christmas this week. Thank you.
I dream of music that makes my heart swell. I dream of trees that take my breath away. I dream of sunrises that wrap me in light. I dream of family dinners that feel like home. I dream of church services that give me hope. I dream of love as the default. So today, as we draw near to Christmas Day, we light the candle of love. May this light burn bright as a reminder that God is here and God is love. We are not alone. Thanks be to God for a love like that. Amen. Please pray with us our prayer of confession. God of good news, you say to me, you are highly favored, but I struggle to see how that could be. You say to me, do not be afraid, but I am afraid all the time. You say to me, even the impossible is possible. Just look at Elizabeth. But hope slips through my hands like water. The impossible still feels impossible. So today I pray, today we pray, teach us to sing like Mary, teach us to laugh like Elizabeth, teach us to trust like the angels. Forgive us when we can only do one at a time or none at all. Amen. Please turn to others around you and offer a gesture of peace. The peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. Sleeping in a manger. 
Soon other angels appeared in the night sky, singing, Glory to God in the highest. The shepherds found Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus in the stable. They sang songs of praise that filled the night and gave thanks to God for the Savior of the world. Thank you. 
Today we have come to the fourth Sunday of Advent. The next stop along our journey will be Christmas Eve, and then we have arrived. I do hope for all of us we've had been able to carve out at least a little time these last four weeks for some reflection, for some meditative reading, for some attending to our spiritual lives. It's so important in these days of isolation and anxiety that we don't let ourselves just drift and drift and drift. And so this morning we read from the first chapter of the Gospel according to Luke, how into whatever drift that Mary's life uh, might have been in, uh, the angel Gabriel shows up and announces an amazing, almost unbelievable, and certainly most mysterious thing. Luke chapter 1, beginning with the 26th verse. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And Gabriel came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But Mary was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob, forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be? For I am still a virgin. The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Though the uh, shopping rush of this Christmas season may be a bit stunted by the threat of COVID-19, though I still see a huge number of Amazon trucks circling the blocks. Even still, I have been struck by how early in the fall Christmas decorations began appearing. I swear I was seeing them a good few weeks before Halloween. In an earlier year, unimpinged upon by pandemic, Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, put the commercial onslaught of the Christmas season this way. I long to shed the great load of arrogant self-reliance, bluster, noisy fear and fantasy to enter the little spaces of Mary's womb, of manger, of silent tomb, where divine fullness is alive, 
and where divine fullness is being continually reborn. His profound spiritual insights urges that I do not need to push my shopping cart past Bethlehem. I need to push open the rough stable door, duck under the low lintel, and tiptoe in. <clears throat> Perhaps that moment will come this Christmas Eve, that time of kneeling beside the manger, of laying down whatever meager gifts we have, of pressing on against the cold and the dark of the night with the bright light of hope held close in our hearts and angel voices ringing in our ears. <clears throat> but for a little while yet this Sunday, we stand further off, lingering in Advent, listening to the angel Gabriel speaking with Mary. The story is so familiar, so much a part of the pageant of Christmas, that it risks losing its great wonder. If we look back in, this, in the ancient scriptures to the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 7, we find the enigmatic promise given to King David that his throne would be established forever. And when the angel speaks to Mary in our biblical passage for today, it is to say that King David's promise will be fulfilled in Mary's unexpected child. This is the wonder of Christmas, that in its great consummation, God's grace would be clothed in flesh and blood and would be born not among the high and the haughty, but to a lowly peasant girl. And most amazingly, the grace of God would wait upon Mary's response. Would she say yes or no? The mythic story of our faith is held in this moment between Gabriel and Mary. The destiny of God's work in the world is hanging upon a young girl's answer. The divine breath is held. What a mystery. What a mystery it is, this story. That the cosmic creative one present beyond the universe might somehow be present in an earthly manger stall. This is the scandal and the deep paradox of our faith, that the divine would be Emmanuel, God with us. In some way, God would be drawn into relationship with us. God would love us into faithfulness, but God would not demand or force obedience. If Mary would not receive the gift, then perhaps the gift would go elsewhere, for it seems that somewhere, somehow, the gift will be given. And yet if Mary says yes, her whole life is changed, not just her body swelling with newness within her, stretch marks and swollen feet, but her heart and her greatest yearning will be for that which she can only hold for a brief time, a yearning that will draw her out into a life lived for others, a life lost to be found again, a life to be transformed. It is no wonder that when the angel spoke to her, Mary pondered what sort of greeting this might be. It is the greatest wonder that having heard the news, she answered, let it be with me 
according to your word. In that moment, she became what the Eastern Orthodox Church tradition calls Theotokos, the God-bearer. In our, in our religious tradition, she was the only person ever asked to do this thing, to carry and birth the divine promise. There are no reasons given in this story for why Mary was chosen for this task. She had no special attributes, no claims of exceptional spirituality. As far as the telling goes, it is simply the whim of God to come and call and consider entrusting to Mary the ultimate mythic engagement of creator and creation. In that engagement, the Orthodox tradition holds that Mary became the mother of God and the mother of all who would dare to consider carrying the promise of God into the world. And the startling aftermath of the mystery we name incarnation is this. We are all called to carry God into the world. We are all invited to be Theotokos, God-bearers. As Barbara Brown Taylor reminds us, we are all meant to be mothers of God. So wrote the medieval mystic, Meister Eckhart. For Meister Eckhart said, what good is it to me if this external birth of the divine Son takes place unceasingly, but does not take place within me? And what good is it to me if Mary is full of grace, if I am not also full of grace? What good is it to me for the Creator to give birth to the Son, if I do not also give birth to Him in my time and culture? This, then, is the fullness of time, when the Son of God is begotten in us. The great wonder of Christmas Nativity is not the blinking lights along roof eaves, and the blow-up lawn sculptures of Santa and reindeer. It is our ongoing rebirthing into the challenging and exhilarating way of Jesus. As the verse of a favorite Christmas carol says, O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray, cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell, O oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Despite our doubts and our misgivings, even as we confront the deep pandemic troubles of our times, the wide systemic racism of our society and culture, and the profound ambiguities of our own faith, may the echoes of hope spoken in the legendary, legendary words of long ago Mary, resonate in our lives. Resonate in our hearts. For nothing will be impossible with God.
wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. What a thought for the end of Advent 2020. So much turning is needed. Turning towards health, turning towards liberation, freedom, turning towards equality and justice. We'll have to consider, we'll have to consider as we approach the manger this year, are we up to it? Are we up to being the oil of that turning, the impulse on the ground of that turning? For remember, If the Christ child is not born in us, the Christ child is not born at all. Let that be our inspiration. Let that be our commitment. And let that be our hope. As you leave the sanctuary this day, Go knowing that you are embraced in the steadfast love of God forever, that you are redeemed in the grace of Jesus Christ now and always, that together we are being empowered by faithful witness and loving service this and every day of our lives. And may God's hope, peace, joy, love, Abide with you. Amen.